Great. So let's um, get underway. Let me just introduce myself for those who don't know me. I am Laura Quinn. I am the Director of Partnerships and Learning for uh, Idealware, which is a, um, a nonprofit organization that provides information about technology for all sorts of folks within the nonprofit realm, including we've been doing a lot of work with the legal aid sector. Um, and I'm excited to have with me John Greiner. John, you want to just introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm John Greiner. I've worked in uh, uh, legal services uh, um, for about 20 years, um, starting as a staff attorney and, and moving into management and, and back into, uh, into technology, initially out of frustration and, and then ultimately out of sort of seeing all the, all the sort of the wonderful opportunities of um, uh, you know the collaborations that have uh, um, that started years ago um, with uh, the Department of Commerce grants, and then um, uh, and then you know certainly more recently with the um, uh, the law help type uh, um, initiatives and online intake. Anyway, so we're um, uh, my, my my focus today is um, uh, uh, is helping um, providers uh, with their you know local enterprise technology, and then with um, collaborations. Fantastic. Um, and we're excited to uh, be talking today about uh, return on investment. John and I were just um, talking a little before uh, the session, and we both kind of geek out on return of investment, on, on investment, which is a little uh, kind of a strange thing to geek out on. Um, but this is, so we are getting the slides up and running here, um, but we're going to just kind of start with uh, the obvious, what the first slides cover, as to why you might care about this topic. Um, so in general, this is a, um, it's a really critical thing that I think that people are really stymied by. They're really not sure where to start. Uh, they're trying to think through, all right, well, some of the, especially in the legal services area, some of these uh, projects can be really expensive. Um, and uh, it can be hard to figure out, okay, what's the benefit in the short term and the long term? And what's the... You know, obviously the benefit is sometimes like, great, we save a lot of money because we don't have to pay phone line expenses. But often it's more like things like there's more justice in the world or, you know, potentially something kind of mediumly measurable, like we're saving staff time or potentially serving more clients, things like that. So that stuff can get really tricky. Uh, but what we're going to posit today is a methodology to help you kind of work through the idea of a plausible ROI. So something that isn't necessarily, it's not going to say, all right, the return is $842, but it's going to uh, help you to say, all right, here's the, the possible the plausible high and low numbers, and here's the plausible, uh, the plausible low and high numbers on benefit and the plausible low and high numbers for cost, and then you can compare those two. Brian, if you want to try uh, passing to me again, I think I'm ready for that. And in the meantime, okay. John, could you talk just a little bit about kind of how you've seen return on investment used in organizations? What are some of the, the real kind of core reasons you would want to have this? Um, sure. So, um, and I, I, I'd say that I got into um, uh, return on investments initially when I was working with uh, with some vendors um, that were proposing technology for um, Indiana Legal Services when I was there, and uh, um, and and you know, and so part of why I got into it was I really wanted to understand how they got to their numbers, um, but it was it was clear that this is a big part of what. You know what the the, the private sector was um, concerned about because the you know the vendors the manufacturers they all spent a lot of time thinking about it um, and uh, and so the, my initial uses were to justify um, uh, making transitions you know it could be sim as simple as moving from um, you know one phone system to another and and there's this upfront cost of it and as Laura was saying you know that that it, you know the, the the metrics the you know are fairly simple there's there you know there's sort of the the cost of, of building and implementing and buying and and then there's that monthly um, savings um, uh, of you know maintenance of your phone service stuff like that um, and and I I basically had to use that to educate 
um, I was very junior, educate uh, the senior management um, about some of the, the various projects that I, I knew made sense. Um, and, and frankly, I think at the time, I didn't really have a good way to quantify those, those additional um, pieces that weren't so numerical, like making intake more um, uh, user-friendly from folks calling into our offices that they wouldn't stay on hold as long. Like, how, did I, how do I quantify that? So over time, it evolved. But you know, so in, the, in the initial um, uh, use, it was very much following the private sector, learning how they did the ROI, and then translating that into what the, you know, what the legal services community cared about. Fantastic. Great. And I am just getting underway with this. Um, sorry, my computer is, is having a little excitement today. Um, so, um, so this is a really critical thing. And we're going to be talking about, as I mentioned, both the plausible ROI, and we're going to be talking about kind of making chains of assumptions. Um, so as you look at things that are a little less straightforward than a phone system, as John has said, um, and we are looking at kind of thinking through, uh, like for instance, the staff time, uh, so what the cost savings are of being able to see more clients potentially. We're going to be looking at kind of putting chains of logic together. Um, John, can you just talk a little bit while I get underway here as to kind of what that, when, you, when we did that together at the, uh, the LSC session, kind of what that exercise of um, kind of tying things together was helpful with for you? Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, well, so, um, so one thing is that, you know, that, that it's, uh, I relate it to a lot of the outcome measurements that, that I think um, a lot of legal services uh, programs have had to grapple with over the last decade, um, where you're, you're making claims about the, um, the outcome for your client based on outputs that you've delivered, and then maybe taking it a step further and trying to, to you know, quantify the impact on their lives going forward. You know, saving um, a family from homelessness um, you know, not, isn't just saving you know, the city or state the cost of shelters, but it's saving um, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, sort of the society at some level from folks who maybe won't attain the same level of education, won't, won't be able to sort of you know, get to um, a, a level of income in their, in their work and you know, profession that they would have if, if they would have been able to kind of continue through um, in their housing, staying in a, in a stable environment with a, you know, a good school. Um, and, and so in some ways, I think it's the same thing with a lot of these projects. You're really, you're trying to, um, and, and I, you know, it's uncomfortable, I got to say, but you're, you're trying to come up with um, uh, a, a, uh, um, an assumption that's plausible. I really love how Laura, you know, kind of uh, uses that term. It's, it, it makes sense. You don't have to feel 100% um, confident that there's um, a, a ream of data behind it that backs it up, but it, it's a logical extension. Um, and again, as, as she gets into um, sort of that process, you know, you can discount the the fact that you're not 100% certain that some of these assumptions are are right on the money. Um, uh, and so, you at the end of the day, you come up with a, a level of of confidence that I think um, your executive directors and litigation directors can um, can appreciate and and frankly then you know feel comfortable moving forward with your initiatives absolutely great um, and it feels like my slides are up and running does that indeed is that true Brian yes definitely they look good great fantastic All right. so sorry for the delay there so so basically that's that's the over that's what we're trying to get to so how do we actually get there from here um, so before we dive into that, I'd love to actually hear from you guys. Um, we're going to try to have some kind of discussion going on in this session, and if it doesn't really work, then I will, <laughs> I will abandon it. Um, but I'm really interested in you um, just kind of typing into the chat one or two projects that you're thinking about right now where you'd be interested in thinking about the return on investment. So basically, we, me and John can think about them, use them as examples, and help you to think through that. So what projects are you thinking about right now? I mean, one, one <laughs> of the projects that I'm looking at with a nonprofit um, that I'm working with is um, kind of a, a basic rights education um, campaign that is um, uh, regarding um, terms of service and other things like that. 
um, something that gives people an opportunity to know what their claims of action may be in regards to consumer fraud type issues. Yep, great. All right, and that's a good example. We've also got uh, straightforward examples like um, uh, phone system. Uh, we've got um, viewer 17 it says, I would like to demonstrate a plausible value for legal information web page. Absolutely. The, the monetization of free information, that's an inch, I would say quantification rather than monetization implies you're going to make money out of it, um, but uh, trying to quantify what the value of that is. Absolutely. Um, perfect. There's some great examples that we can work from. So, I, I would, I would so add if, if you want one other one, and this is maybe, um, yeah. again, I think some programs are starting. It's moving from uh, uh, you know, file, uh, network file shares to a knowledge management or document management system. Mm. I think there are a number of programs that are grappling with that. Um, it's complex. Um, it, 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 you know, it, there, there are parts of it that make it sound very valuable to um, executive directors and the like, but, um, but it's, you know, it's, there are so many unknowns. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. That's another great one. All right. So let's start by thinking through what is probably the more complex side of the equation, probably the one that most of us have the less handle on. So basically there's benefits and then there's costs. I think we as technology professionals often have a kind of a sense of the cost, but it's the benefits that become really tricky. So let's start there. So there is some fairly straightforward ones that we can start to fairly easily itemize. So there's the obvious one of how much money will it literally save? So things like, all right, well, we don't need to pay for that, like the phone line we just mentioned. You don't need to pay as much for phone lines. You don't need to pay as much for software or hardware because you're moving to something that's cheaper. So that's an easy one. There's staff time saved. So something like a document management system, you're presumably looking to at least eventually save people time, whether that's simply time in finding a document or time in not having to create as many things or you know, time in having more knowledge for the organization in total so you forget less stuff. And so, and we'll talk in, in just a couple minutes about, so this is a fairly straightforward one um, to try to calculate out comparatively as to how do we quantify staff time saved. We go more and more down what we're going to look at, what we call a, a spectrum of tangibility. <laughs> so we go from things that are very tangible, like cost saved and um, uh, staff time saved, to things that are somewhat tangible, like more clients served. What's the value of having served more clients? And we'll talk about that. Then there's the idea that you may have served clients better. And what's the value of that better service? which gets pretty interesting. Outcomes achieved, so like homelessness averted. What is the value in dollars of the fact that you have averted homelessness? Things get a little tricky here. And ultimately we get all the way down to the end of the spectrum to say, well, we've increased justice in the world. And down at this end of the spectrum, we need to pretty clearly say, well, we're not going to be able to measure that. You know, we can potentially try to think around things like homelessness averted or literal money saved through debt aversion, but we're not going to be able to say, all right, here's the monetary worth of justice in the world. So that's obviously a short list of what could be a lot of benefits. And this is a really valuable start to um, any process. So basically just thinking through, all right, let's brainstorm. Let's brainstorm all the possible um, things that uh, we might be able to um, uh, either quantify or just is a benefit for a project. John, we've got the example of um, illegal information web pages. Do you want to just brainstorm a little bit on that specific example as to what some 
benefits might be, whether quantifiable or not quantifiable? Um, sure. I, I, I think one, one um, sort of maybe um, direct measurable uh, benefit would be time saved as staff refer clients to uh, or, or, or applicants um, uh, uh, to that page um, in, instead of, you know, uh, walking them through it or giving them um, that page as a starting point and so that they advance their conversation, um, you know, down a ways after they're done reviewing that material. So there's, there's you know, potential for yep. direct clients, um, uh, staff, staff time savings. Um, and, uh, and then maybe I, I think to the extent that you have some, um, uh, uh, you know, um, web feedback, um, you know, uh, um, tool set up on your site, um, you know, you might even get, uh, you know, clients to give you um, some sampling, some data on um, the information and how they used it. And, and again, whether they, um, you know, were able to avert, um, uh, you know, homelessness or, or, you know, they, they, they maintained a, a good record of their payment on their rent or something like that. And you can, you know, then you can again calculate out how that would translate into, um, you know, saving the, the community or, or, uh, um, or that individual um, uh, resources. So you've got in there the idea as well of um, uh, more clients served. You can pro probably more people will see information that is online than your advocates can actually pass on. Um, so you've got the idea that you're serving more people. It can also be potentially a way for advocates in the community, so people at you know churches or community centers, to find that information to be able to easily serve those folks or more easily be able to serve those folks without your direct help. So that's saving time and reaching more people. Um, so we could probably go on. Um, but the idea is that you're brainstorming and you're coming up with kind of everything, everything that you, you can think of that is a benefit. Um, obviously, also let me just mention that there's the benefit of people having better information. So there is the idea that more people are going to get to justice, you know, information being logically to all of us. Empowering people, yep. Yep, absolutely. And I would just Great. say the other thing is that it might, it might deflect, so it might reduce the number of clients served, um, in, in essence, saving time. But so, you know, to the extent that people know more in, um, about whether, you know, they um, have something where they should contact a lawyer or not or try to get uh, representation, um, or where to go instead of contacting you and you know, waiting on hold or, or having that back and forth to get to the point where you, you recognize you can't serve them directly, um, it could actually you know, sort of reduce the number of intakes or, or reduce the number of direct referrals. Yeah, so in right, fact, which, you, you've which may end up saving you. Different. Yep. Sorry, Dad. Oh, yeah, which, which may end up saving you time on that screening process or something else. So you really want to seriously consider what, what metric. Um, you're looking at because if you're able to allow someone to refer themselves to one of your partner organizations, you've just saved a bunch of time that would have been spent screening and referring. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You've actually got staff savings in two different directions that, as we've just brainstormed, you've got the idea that people are potentially self-serving with their direct questions. So instead of calling your helpline to ask you, they are looking it up. And then there's also the the idea that they are not trying to get more detailed services when potentially they don't, you know, they don't, uh, they're not eligible for it or it's not appropriate at all. So there's kind of two different directions there. All right. Um, so we are, um, uh, so we're going to continue down the spectrum here and uh, I'll define what I mean by that. Um, you can see that we've taken the example we've got and uh, pretty ex expanded pretty much on it. So certainly we're still taking examples if you have um, kind of a project that you're thinking of uh, that you want us to um, go down. So when you look at kind of corporate methodologies or literature around ROI analysis, there's a big emphasis on what's called intangibles. And in, I really dislike the way that people use the word intangibles often when you look at this because it implies that they are a thing. You know, all right, well, this thing is clearly tangible, and this thing is clearly intangible. But in fact, it's really, it's a fuzzy line. It's a, a spectrum from things that are 
easy to measure in dollars. So like for instance, all right, we're reducing mailing costs because we're, oh, if, if you are mailing things, then there's another advantage of potentially putting web information up that is opposed to actually sending out postcards to inform people of their rights on this particularly very important thing. You are serving that through a web page. So that's an obvious, all right, we're literally not, we don't have that expense. You've got advocate time saved measured in dollars, which is not too hard. You've got homeless list averted, which is, we'll actually look at a potential calculation for that, is doable but more complicated. And then there you get to things that are impos practically impossible. And basically, at some point, you just, and we'll look at this in more detail, you just basically say, I decree this stuff at the end intangible. I am done with attempting to quantify, and everything to the left of this point I'm going to define as intangible. So it's not like there is some, uh, you know, platonic borderline, that there is some state in the world where things, some things are tangible and some things are intangible, but rather there is a, uh, just a spectrum there. And Laura, would you would you say that? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, would you say that that almost any any initiative, any change, is going to have a fairly broad range of of uh, of what's measurable and not measurable? I mean, so even like if we move from mailing postcards to mailing to emailing or to texting, um, I can see some significant intangibles like you know what's the value of being able to inform people immediately you know that to have that, that yep. instant that ur urgent communication I mean that's going to be a little bit harder than knowing those direct you know postcards that you don't have to print and the postage you don't have to pay yep absolutely no and that's an excellent um, an excellent point as we brainstormed around the the web pages there's not going to be a single benefit per project there's going to be lots of benefits per project some of which are hopefully quantifiable in some way, and many of which will not be very quantified, or at least not practically quantifiable. I, you could make the argument that anything could be measured. Like you could attempt to, through like a million dollar university study, attempt to look at the amount of justice created in your community, but that's not a practical approach. So you basically say, all right, I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, so yes, so, so there's going to be a whole host of benefits for any one of these things. Fantastic. Brian, anything to add about kind of this idea of a spectrum and things that might be along it? Hmm. No, I, um, I guess in putting together this spectrum, um, it's often a good idea to get together a set of stakeholders um, to brainstorm things that may be on here um, because your partners or other stakeholders may come up with some things on here that um, aren't already there or aren't apparent to you inside your organization. Yeah. We actually, so when um, we did this live at the TIG conference and we actually walked through an exercise, which I think is a pretty plausible exercise for you guys to do in individual organizations. So we basically, we brainstormed projects, actually we grouped people by potential projects, so we just assigned out projects that they were thinking about. Each group brainstormed benefits onto post-it notes, and at this point in the process, we asked them to arrange them approximately into a spectrum from most to least measurable. John, as you were doing this exercise, so John was a participant in this workshop, what was, what did you, what did you find as you arranged that spectrum? Was that a helpful thing for you um, kind of as a mental exercise? Uh, it, it was, and I think that, that, that uh, um, you know, it was also, I mean, for one thing, actually, it was, it was, um, it was actually kind of fun um, because, it, it, the, you know, how, how everybody views um, what's measurable and, and, and frankly, how they would measure, you know, uh, uh, you know, different elements of uh, different uh, benefits. Um, I, I found intriguing, you know, that, 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 and again, I think Brian, your point's really uh, important one. It's, it's kind of like how you approach an ethics issue. You should never, you should never do ethics on your own. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe never do ROI on your own. It's a, it's a, it's um, because the, the, the exercise is so valuable, um, more valuable, I think, as, as, a, as part of a team. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that, that 
to the extent that there were folks who hadn't gone through similar, you know, sort of uh, um, exercises before, um, as as they started to think about it a little bit more, you know, both the benefits and sort of how we would measure it, I think that they, you know, they it, people pretty quickly picked it up and they sort of, you know, got to um, a level of sophistication um, uh, where I think they were comfortable to go back to their programs and 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 run through, you know, that, the, this process on their own. You know, projects. Uh, I mean, because even some of the harder mm -hmm. ones, frankly, together we figured out ways that we would would measure them. So it was a Great. lot of fun. Great, and let's um let's move on to that. So kind of thinking through. All right. So how how would we measure some of these more sophisticated ones? Sorry, Brian, were you um, chipping in? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought I had someone um, jumping in. Great. So let's just look at this idea of. Um, kind of chains of assumptions which are going to lead you to be able to quantify benefits that are potentially not immediately, you know, measurable. So some things can be measured directly. So you have things like, we talked about mailing costs saved, you toner saved, decreased temp hours, you know, like if you're changing the way that you're doing data entry or things like that. Uh, increased fee for service, so logically you're actually getting more money. Um, but more typically, you need to actually link things together. So basically to say, all right, we want to figure out how much advocate time is going to be saved. So for instance, let's think about a, like a document assembly. So basically, if we implement a online uh, assembly for this particular form, about how much time do we think it would take a lawyer to create that form for one client? And this is where we start to get to low and high numbers. So what's the lowest amount of time? You know, well, there's no way it would take them less than five minutes to create this form. And, well, okay, they're doing something wrong if it takes them more than 20 minutes to do this form. So there you have a low and a high number for the average amount of time per client. You've got then the, aver the hourly rate of an attorney, which is hopefully a fairly knowable number to you. And the average number of forms you do, or the forms that you think that you could replace with this, um, the document assembly process per year. So, and what that, uh, that, what that comes to is now the amount of advocate time saved measured in dollars. So let's look at another example here. Uh, so here, basically here, we just have the low and the high. Um, so basically we can say, all right, we've got anywhere from two to 10 minutes. We've got 800 to 1200 clients. So here's our low and here's our high. And they're fairly par far apart. So we've got a low of 2,000 and a high of 16,000. And that's okay. That is, we just acknowledge that that is our level of certainty. And we'll talk a lot about what to do with your level of certainty later. Um, but if this thing is going to be a $9,000 investment, like basically smack dab in the middle, it's unclear whether you're going to get a return on it. And that's okay, because sometimes it's just not clear. So in this, John was talking about this. John, you want to talk a little bit about how this is more of an art than a science and going more towards the, the plausible than the, you know, specific? Well, and, and it, exactly, I mean, or maybe it's, there's parts of it that are science or that are math, and, but, but those are the easier parts. Um, but I would say even there, um, you, you know, what, how, like, for instance, you, you know, the, the hourly rate of an attorney, I mean, should you take the hourly rate that you actually pay them on their paycheck, or should you take what some people call the fully loaded cost? So what's the cost of a percentage of their supervisor, their receptionist, the, the health care, the, um, the office space, you know, so like, um, the, the, so, so there are there are a lot of decisions to make, even on pieces that are fairly cut and dry. But certainly, moving to, you know, um, the the more esoteric, as as Laura was um, you know, talking about, you know, like the the averting not esoteric really, but but uh, you know, quantifiable. Like there are a number of measures that you could look at for averting homelessness in terms of the impact on client lives, on the on their family. 
um, on on the next generation, on the neighborhood, um, uh, on their community. You know, so it's um, and I, I think part of it is also sort of figuring out who you're talking to with and what you know who your funders are and what they're interested in, and also um, you know to the extent that you're you're trying to make the case with your um, with your own colleagues in your organization or with your collaboration, your 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 consortium. I mean, I guess it, it, it could be also useful to look at something um, like a um, unified communication system or a new phone system and what are the different ROIs that um, you would suggest uh, an organization start to look at for a project like that? Because that's a very common one that many organizations are going through. Right. And uh, well, so <laughs> I mean, I, I think that, that uh, um, you know, so again, the, to the extent we were talking about some of the savings, um, you know, one of the things I, I, I think that, that folks um, sometimes don't think about are, are some of the, the costs, and we'll, we'll get to some of that. But, you know, for instance, on the phone system, there is this sort of initial um, cost to transition to it, whether it's cloud-based or premise-based. Um, uh, but then, you know, a lot of folks, um, I, I think, have a hard time uh, projecting budgeting for the ongoing uh, upkeep, management, maintenance, support, um, of that system, um, so there are there are costs like that. But on the on the benefit side, I think with with phone systems, um, you know, there's the the level of um, frustration where folks, you know, basically sort of drop the call. They call it call abandonment um, uh, because they can't they either have to wait too long or they can't navigate some of these um, uh, ACD systems where you you know you press one for housing and two for family and so forth that. Um, uh, and so, if you're if you're looking at a new phone system with programming options that make make it more user friendly, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I think you can again, you what 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 does that do for your relationship with the client or the applicant at that point? Um, do you start that call when you actually when a live person picks up with um, with a, a a caller who isn't frustrated and, and upset and maybe. Um, thinks less of your organization to start with. Why do you have such a crazy phone system? Um, uh, or um, another functionality that um, a lot of folks um, are taking advantage of, you know, are, are using phone systems to improve language access. Are you are you um, going the opposite direction? Are you being very friendly to folks who are are not um, principally English speakers um, and making them feel more comfortable so that when you do the um, uh, ultimately the interview or even if you bring on um, an interpreter, you're you're getting. Um, uh, 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 you know, sort of uh, to that point where they have a level of trust and, and, and belief in your organization that you really care that you do want to serve them. What impact does that have on their, um, uh, on their representation, on your ability to represent, on the quality of that representation because they're more likely to share the information you need to make the right determination? I don't know, Brian, what, do, what, do you, what would you add yeah. to that? One of the big things to really think about when you're doing an, a new tech project like that is um, not just what the technology currently does and how you would do that better, um, but also uh, new features, new ways to integrate people into that. So for example, when we were doing ours here at Northwest Justice Project, um, previously to be a member of the call center, you had to physically be here in Seattle. Uh, the new system that we put in allowed individuals from across the state um, and also potentially outside pro bono attorneys during their lunch, other things like that. So it, it gave us a way to take uh, volunteers or other individuals and possibly link them into um, that system. So you, re you really have to look at what the technology that you're putting in place is capable of, not just the business case of what you're currently replacing. Right, right. Right, right, absolutely. To, to do and that here, business just analysis, a quick, sort of yep. the opportunity. Yep. And just to quickly go through just one last example here of things that get, you know, really very fuzzy. Um, so the idea of averting homelessness. Um, and the idea here is that I don't expect that any of us really know any of these numbers, you know, that we are even doing just wild guesstimates, but wild guesstimates are useful. You can see whether the, it's plausible that something will, will pay for itself. So basically if we say, all right, if we do this technology, we'll be able to increase the number of eviction cases that we take on 
by, we think, you know, it's got to be at least 15 cases that we'll take on. But, you know, these are really, you know, time-consuming cases to take on. There probably we're not going to do more than increasing it by 30. Um, and even if you say, I don't know, maybe five we could take on, or maybe it's as many as 30, that still is potentially worth doing to basically do a kind of a back of the, nap, back of the napkin calculation here. Um, likelihood that an evicted client will be homeless. And similarly, we might be taking just wild guesstimates, um, or we might have some anecdotal data from our own client pool, which we can then kind of wildly extrapolate. Um, you're hearing a lot of wild from me, wild guesstimates, wild right. extrapolation. And I think that that can feel really scary when you're putting numbers on things. But the idea is if you say, all right, this is the least I could possibly imagine, and not just this is the most I can possibly imagine, then at worst what you'll get to is I don't have enough data to know anything. You know, in this case, you've wildly guesstimated 12 to 40,000, and we might actually be able to find some research for this particular number, the cost to the state of a homeless person. So what we know here is that, all right, well, this seems plausibly somewhere between nine and $60,000 in costs averted to the state. So the, the uh, dollar's uh, equivalent of the averting homelessness. And even if this, we knew this is somewhere between 2000 and $100,000, that probably becomes not useful. That's such a wide range. But it's interesting to run through and to say, all right, do I know enough that I could say, well, even at my lowest estimates, this has got to be like $20,000 or whatever. You know, it's worth doing the, the wild guesstimates. Right. Hey, Laura, can I just add, I mean, and again, yep. to, to, uh, to Brian's point earlier that, you know, again, working together. So here is sort of an uh, opportunity to work with the courts because they have data, and and frankly, the you know the the local state um, government, um, and I, I think even engaging those conversations with them can lead to interesting um, you know new ideas and opportunities. Oh, you're interested in this stuff, or maybe they're not thinking about it. Um, so maybe even funding opportunities. Um, the fact that you're you're being systematic about it and you're and you're 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 trying to um, establish more rigor in your in your planning, um, I think will it'll it, it can only lead to positive things. And certainly, um, if there's data out there, you may not be able to afford, as as Laura mentioned, that million dollar academic study. But um, you know when you when you reach out and talk to people and they have data that that maybe is again a little bit more um, detailed, maybe a little bit more reliable. And you use that; um, it's both a benefit for your ROI calculation, but it's also now a uh, you know another person who's uh, more likely interested in what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, I, I strongly agree with that, especially on the um, funding opportunity side. Once you engage courts as partners, or city government as partners, or um, local schools or university as partners, um, it does open you up to some interesting forms of funding also. There are particular grants that are aimed at those particular partners um, that can be used to fund this type of stuff. Northwest Justice Project has went after both uh, city grants and uh, BTOP uh, broadband grants, um, and then the ATJ board that I work with has went after federal ABA money um, targeted at improving um, court services using the administrative office of the courts as a partner. Mm, great. Absolutely. So uh, continuing down kind of our, uh, our path here, at some point, so you've got a list of benefits for your particular technologies. You've got them arranged from most and least measurable. And at some point, you simply stop, either because things become super impractical to have any ideas or any numbers around, or because, in fact, you have enough information. So you might, and we'll be looking at the cost side in just a few minutes here, so you might have enough information on the cost side to say, well, I don't need to go any further. Um, it, this has already, I've already made the, a, a good case that this will pay for itself. Um, and then you can basically say, you know, all right, in addition to these measurable things, we get all this great intangible that we get to create more justice in the world. And obviously that's also useful for something, you know, that also has value. We don't even have to measure that. Um, if you are finding that 
most of the project is things that you can't measure, or in fact, the things that you can't measure are just so important comparatively, you may find yourself with a different kind of mental weighing, which is basically saying, is it plausible that the, these intangibles are worth this will will make this project worthwhile even though the quantifiable aspects will not. So basically to say, all right, well, our, it looks like our expenses are going to run somewhere in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. We can show that there's going to be probably somewhere between ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of benefit. Is the what we haven't measured, how what we haven't put numbers on, is it plausible? That that makes up that additional ten to twenty ten to twenty thousand dollars, and that is a discussion to have as an organization. You know, if we're talking about a document management system, is it plausible that the like, for instance, the morale boost of not having to slog through a million documents and not having to recreate things that you feel like you might have already created, is that morale boost worth this differential? If you're finding that there's a differential. So it's a it's a thought uh, kind of a thought project. It's it's something to be as a discussion point for your organization. John, or and I would just add. I mean, again, and, through, let's, well, I'll put this out there to see if okay. um, uh, if anybody wants to take us up on this offer to put things out there that they think might be measurable and see if we have thoughts on them. And sorry, John, I cut you off. I, I was just going to say that you know that, and there's been you know increasing talk uh, of uh, of this, and and certainly the TIG is a, is about taking risks. But there's you know there's a level of risk taking involved because in part it may be that your calculations are off, um, or that you're not quantifying the things that are that maybe would be quantifiable if you had thought um, about more of the you know sort of the potential costs or benefits. Um, uh, but I, I think you know. I think as you, you you sort of said in Texas, I mean, there's you know, there's a that that there's a sort of a point at which you've got you feel like you've got enough. Um, maybe it's not. It, there's not a you know um, the the ROI in in what you can sort of say are hard dollars isn't there. Um, but but that the yeah the those intangibles you know that that let's 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 do it and then frankly when we when we get to that other side of that project and we're and we're sort of getting the feedback from the staff or from our clients or seeing the impact on our work and the outcomes you know then we'll know to continue it or or we'll we'll stop and we'll 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 change tracks or we'll we'll shut it down um yeah uh so anyway yep absolutely <laughs> Let's take an example from, um, so Brian offered early up that he's working on some uh, kind of uh, advocacy information to help people think through terms of service and stuff like that. And so logically for a project like that, you're going to be looking at at least one of the core returns is going to be basically uh, keeping consumers from getting sucked into terms of service that they shouldn't be into, uh, that they shouldn't have to commit to. So let's think through how one could potentially form a chain there. So you'll logically start with the number of people that you think you are affecting. So how many people are likely to sign up for a term of service, a term of service that is, you know, not what it should be. And then thinking through, all right, how would we measure the monetary impact of that? Um, so is, it a, is there a monthly, like they are paying more per month? Is there some percentage of people who are going to get sucked into something that, you know, like a, like a payday lending, that it's not, not everybody that will be affected, but some people will be affected? Uh, and then to think through, all right, of the people who are affected, what's the dollar amount on average, a high, or low, high and low? So again, just kind of forming our, our chain of assumptions around this particular area. And basically we get to, at the end, the realm of, okay, here is the amount that the consumers are saving by doing this advocacy effort. All right, um, questions or comments about kind of this whole idea of benefits before we're going to talk relatively quickly through costs, um, which I think are just a little more straightforward. 
Um, and then we're going to wind up by kind of looking through some scenarios of what this might look like in terms of, okay, we've got the benefits minus the costs, high and lows. How might you use that to make decisions? Questions or thoughts on benefits before we move on to costs? Um, I think uh, with the uh, terms of service example, um, looking at one other potential benefit for that, um, what we were looking at is the ability to reach out to potential clients that that educational information mm -hmm. uh, may also allow us to find uh, clients that would work for a test case for particular theories that we were looking at. So it has this kind of marketing benefit um, as part of it. So we're educating consumers, but also letting them know if you've been harmed in this way, we can also help you. Yeah, and that's interesting. And that sounds like something that you might think about measuring potentially in fundraising dollars. So I would mm -hmm. assume that you're testing out this case with the idea that, well, obviously you're going to increase the justice in the world, but that also you might be able to fundraise around the idea that this is going to be a really important thing to do. So you could think through how much money might you raise, what's the likelihood you're going to raise it, what's the likelihood of clients you're going to get for it. Yeah, so kind of tying that together into a chain of assumptions. Awesome. Yep. Fantastic. Um, so let's think um, quickly through costs here. So some of these are really straightforward. Like I suspect that none of us are going to um, try to think through their costs without thinking about the hardware and software costs. So that's a fairly obvious one. And then you've also got the staff time around it. So both, uh, and two really important sides to this, you've got both the, uh, the time and the cost to plan it, to make sure that you're going to effectively design it for success, and then to actually implement it, to roll it out, to train. Uh, these are, in my mind, kind of two halves of the project, which are often fairly similar in size. It's interesting, some people tend to really overestimate the planning part and underestimate how long it'll actually take to make it happen. And then some people do the flip side that they underestimate how long it will take to plan. They're just kind of like, well, you know, we're going to do a little something, but really we need to just get rolling on, um, on building this thing. Um, so it's, basic, it's important to think about these as, as almost equal partners in your project. You want to think about your processes around this particular thing. Some types of, it's going to depend some on the type of project that you're working on, but a lot of the types that we've talked about here involve, you know, staff members, lawyers, advocates, even clients doing things in different ways. And if you're going to change how things work, you need to make sure you think about not just the technology, but you think through the process. John, you want to give us an example of something you've worked on where you, where you thought about kind of the process as well as the technology? Um, uh, sure. I mean, and, and, I, and I think that, that uh, um, probably most folks on the call have, um, have dealt with processes with case management change, case management system changes. Um, but it's, it's certainly, you know, the, the opportunities, um, you know, around any of these um, uh, initiatives are, you know, and as Brian was sort of pointing out, uh, you know, are, are, are very significant. It's not just replacing one set of technologies with another that, that's identical. Typically they offer new opportunities or, or you have an opportunity to train people to do things differently. Um, but certainly I think, you know, the, the whole intake process, you know, what's the data we really need? How do we, you know, get, um, uh, you know, get the, the sort of that essential data, build that relationship. Um, uh, or not impede that relationship by asking a lot of what seems like bureaucratic and, and, and very private personal information you know, from clients. So when do you ask for a certain data? Um, how do you ask for it? Um, and then building that into the system so that it, it, it flows the way that, that, uh, that sort of the group, the, uh, the experts who are really the, the program folks um, believe it should, and, and frankly, allowing for, on all these um, projects, allowing for the fact that whatever, you know, your best thinking is not going to be perfect, um, and so, and maybe this is again part of the planning is planning for that 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 month or two down the road where you go back, evaluate, and and uh, and and adjust. Yep, absolutely. 
So there's some other costs to keep in mind. Um, consultant costs, um, that if you're going to need to bring in outside time, you obviously need to pay for that. Training costs, really important. If you're changing processes, then regardless of whether they're actually using, your end users are using technology or not, you're going to need to train them in the processes. You want to make sure that you think through training not just as a system, a technology thing, but something about help that also helps them understand how to do the things that they need to do um, from a process perspective. Um, thinking about just staff time in general, so thinking through the steps on your project um, and how much staff time is going to be involved. Uh, for instance, some projects may be really intensive with the amount of advocate hours that need to be spent. Like if you're doing a document assembly project, there's a little bit of technology time and a lot of lawyer time in thinking through kind of that whole decision tree and things like that. And then last but certainly not least, to think through not only this year's cost, the cost in getting it up and running, but the cost to maintain it down the road. Um, to basically remember that basically nothing is going to support itself. So you could, this could be an area in which your, uh, your maintenance costs go down. You have something that's actually easier to support than whatever you're replacing, or if you are replacing something. But it could well be that this is you're increasing your ongoing costs, and you want to make sure you take that into account. <laughs> you have more intangible costs as well. Um, you've got the idea of morale. Um, change is hard. Even if everybody agrees that the old thing sucks, having a new thing is still hard. It's still a distraction. It's still something that people need to take time out of their obviously really busy day to, to deal with, which leads to the idea of opportunity costs. So if you weren't doing this project, so any project where you're asking people to commit any kind of mental bandwidth to it is somewhat distracting from other things they might be doing. And so thinking through what is it that you're not doing and is there a potential a much bigger return on things that you should be doing instead. And that could include anything. That could include technology projects or that could just simply mean serving more clients. Um, so to make sure that you're thinking through kind of there's obviously a limited amount of time in the day and, and hundreds of things that people could be doing with that time, what actually makes sense. And logically, some of these may be intangibles in the same way. So you have the same spectrum of tangibility to intangibility that we looked at on the, on the benefit side. I just want to add. John, where to, do you feel that people tend to run into trouble when when estimating costs? Um, well, I just want I just wanted to add something to your last point. That, that sorry, yeah. and then I'll, I'll, but but you know I, I think that uh, you know these these initiatives um, uh, that that we sometimes take on in a silo. You know, there's this great idea, and frankly, there's great ROI. I mean, the challenge I think for a lot of agencies is really doing um, the the planning work more broadly. And so, if you have a plan, if you have, you know, like you, you're you're evaluating your program overall, and you're and you're trying to come up with sort of the the strategic sort of priorities. You know, what are you going to do? How are you going to like? What we really want to do is improve our legal work supervision. You know, or we really want to improve. Um, you know our 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 development, you know, our resource development, you know, with fundraising, and so we so that may then lead into what are the you know maybe the technology projects that would support um, uh, maybe like social media, you know, like better networking to help you um, raise awareness of your organization. You know, like I, I I kind of I kind of find that <laughs> frankly that there are innovators within the agencies. Um, but I think who have great ideas and, and get a lot of great stuff done, but it's, I think one of the jobs is to get the rest of your agency on board with the notion that we really need to rethink a lot of what we're doing. And then you know, in terms of the opportunity cost, then we're all on the same page in terms of you know, we're going to do this instead of that, or we think this is worth evaluating first. Um, so you're not blindsided. You don't, you don't you know, you know, go down that road um, on some massive project like a phone system and, and frankly, the impact is significant, but it's not as significant or maybe as critical as some of the other, you know, needs of the agency. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that's Absolutely. maybe more out of frustration. And, and so again, the planning should be <laughs> in a vacuum. Tech, technology folks, even legal technology folks, really um, 
need to bring people um, uh, in, uh, you know, to, to think about these, um, these matters. And that may be hard to just get them to make the time to sit down over a series of weeks to, you know, to, you know, you don't need to necessarily bring in a consultant for this, but what are the issues? What are the needs? Um, so I, I think that that will help improve, I think, the, uh, um, you know, the quality of the decisions on what, what you uh, pursue and what you don't. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right, so let's um, kind of put this all together with a few kind of closing um, kind of thought pieces here, and then we'll come back around for any, any questions or uh, comments that you guys have. So basically, you then you take all of your benefits and you add them together, <laughs> and then you take all your costs and add them together. So here's our benefit. Um, of if we assume that all of these things are, so this looks like, um, trying to, it, it looks like a document assembly system except for the mailing cost. I'm trying to imagine what, what mailing cost is there. I don't think there was an actual project behind this, this list. So we basically say for this particular project, we've got a, a low of about 16,000 and a high of 83,000. Uh, one of the things that's important as you go through this exercise is you definitely don't want to present these numbers as 16,383. That's far too exact for what we've actually done. So that's basically, that's about, so we've got a low of about 16,000 and a high of about 80,000 is what we have here. Um, and you wanna, you just, the more exact you present them, the more authoritative they seem, and the less, uh, so either people will, start to really question, you know, all right, where did this number come from that it's so very exact, um, instead of thinking of it as a kind of a, uh, an opener for discussion. So you've got the benefits versus the cost. So let's say this is what we've come to for this, this particular project. So the benefits, as we just added up, we've got Sixteen to eighty-three thousand dollars. It's somewhere in there, plus intangibles. So those mean to us. And we've got the costs are somewhere between twenty to forty plus intangibles. John, what would this mean to you if you were looking at this? So what do you just kind of a, a stream of consciousness? What's your thought on whether this project might be worth it? Things to think about. I mean, I, so so one of it is one of the thoughts is again, is this is this sort of an important? Is it strategic? Is there some you know um, value here that sort of advances the agency's mission? Um, I think it's certainly worth um, uh, proposing it um, in part just to get you know again, if you've done this somewhat in a in a small group and you want to expand that conversation, propose it you know share this out that. That there are these, um, uh, you know, potentially there's this sort of real, you know, hard dollar um, benefit, so that we will, you know, um, we will be ahead of the game, so to speak, after um, we finish the project, um, and 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 then frankly get the, you know, get 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 folks to, um, uh, you know, uh, wade in and and critique it, and but I, I mean again, your I think your point's a really good one about don't don't try to give people the misimpression that all these numbers are so exact. I mean, un let them understand your thinking, but. Um, but that these are, you know, estimations, and, and they may have wildly higher estimations on both sides. Um, yeah. uh, so I, I think it's, this is worth worth um, uh, uh, consideration in my, my view. Yeah. Yeah, so basically this is a back of the napkin analysis, which I, I would agree. This says this isn't a, a ludicrous project. This is also a slam dunk project. Um, so as a lot, I think John's immediate reaction um, kind of framed in a different way was that it comes uh, down to a lot of intangibles here. Um, so basically thinking through does it, how does it position us for other things compared to like the cost of change and morale. Um, so this is basically an ROI that tells you that this is, this is a plausible project but it's not an obvious project. So you need to think this through and think about those intangibles. Here's some other things to look at. You know, here is one at the top here. You've got, okay, the benefits, 16,000 to 25,000, and the costs are 30,000 to 40,000. 
So unless you've got some hell of a t intangibles over here and very little intangibles on this side, this seems like maybe not the right project. You could, or, or to say that this is a project that is all about you know, increasing ac access to justice in some unquantifiable way, or it's all about advancing the brand awareness of the organization, or basically to get buy-in that this is not about the quantitative value of this project, um, that, that it's all about the, the, the intangibles. Here's one on the bottom here where basically what we've calculated is we don't know. <laughs> that, that this is, we don't know what the benefits are going to be. Um, the costs are pretty substantial. It could pay off big. It could not pay off at all. Basically, what we, what we, would, what we look at in this analysis is we say, all right, this is a relatively high risk project where we don't actually have very much information. And so we come back around to, is there a way to get more information or is, does this make sense to, to take this knowing that we're not really sure what the benefits are going to be? Um, and that is an equally effective, I mean, so it's basically a quantification of what is known. And in that case, it's not much. Uh, well, we know the costs actually reasonably, to a reasonably finite degree. It's the benefits that have this just huge range. Um, and that is a totally reasonable thing to present. You know, you asked me to do a, an ROI on this. Here's what we know, you know, which is maybe not enough to make a decision based on that. So we're going to need to make a decision based on something other than an ROI. All right. Brian, what do you think about this whole laying out, as, as we've laid out this whole process, I think this is a, just the, this very specific model and methodology here is uh, potentially new to you. Does this seem like something that, that resonates? What seems like it might be most useful in this process? Hmm. No, I, I think the most useful piece is really looking at the different types of return on investment, that scale that goes all the way from uh, the intangibles, for lack of a better word for it, to the concrete. And being able to really divide each of those out also allows you to successfully pitch the project to different stakeholders, because there are going to be people who care about different pieces on that spectrum. Yep. That makes sense to me. Yeah. John, if there is one thing that you're hoping people will, will take, a, by the way, this would be a great time if you have questions to put questions into the chat. We'll certainly take all, all comers here. Um, what, what would be your kind of one piece of advice, John, on this, on this topic if people are only taking one thing away with them? Oh, gosh. Well, I, I mean, I, I, my, my, I guess my one hope is that people would um, take this back and and uh, and run through this exercise. I think you know, with with some colleagues, um, uh, maybe some colleagues. You know, if you're thinking about again a, a project that that crosses programs in particular, those are really interesting. And and I know um, uh, a number of uh, um, a number of states are doing a lot of of, of interesting um, collaborations. Um, uh, you know, run through that exercise and 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 see for yourself because I think it just can be a real eye opener, um, and frankly, it may it may reinforce the decisions that may you know. So you might do it with the project that you're already engaged in, um, or it might point out you know potential weaknesses, things that you might want to adjust. So you know, one of the my other thoughts on on your one of the prior slides about where the costs and the benefits are. Um, are close, or where it's you know it's, it's sort of a margin call of whether you know marginal call whether we really should do it or not. Um, it might also lead me to go back to think about so how what can I do? Can I use, can I pick different technologies? Can I reduce the 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 likely cost of this mm -hmm. initiative? Can I, um, for instance, and again I don't think necessarily that interns are the the solution for a lot of these projects, but are, is there some <laughs> way to get labor you know lower cost labor? Um, uh, and um, you know, or, and or um, you know, how can I improve the certainty of um, because a lot of these projects go up in cost as as the length of time it takes to implement them. Can I you yeah. know somehow think about um, carving out more of my you know staff attorney's time to work on this now? 
um, instead of getting like just a couple hours a week over six months. Um, so that, that if, 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 if I've got that, you know, that, that gut feeling that this is really worth doing, what can I do to now um, rework it? And then frankly, you know, I mean, again, going back to those benefits, maybe take another stab at the intangibles um, in part by expanding that conversation with others who, who will, will, you know, sort of expand your perspective. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and another just that made me think of, as you were saying that, John, the idea of also doing kind of pilot to if we don't really know or in the realm in which both costs and benefits, I just have this really high range and we have no, basically we have no idea what the ROI is to do something that's going to add to our information about that, like doing some small project with the goal of understanding better what this will cost and what value it will bring. And, and talking with Brian and others who, you know, because like, to, to yeah. your point, so you're know, like, who's done it? Uh, who, and, and it may not be that they've done your thing, but who's done something similar and, and can you learn from that? And again, that's sort of expanding the conversation, benefiting from the fact that, that you're not alone, really, in some ways. You know, you've got, you've got a community of folks out there that are, um, are, are typically very eager to share what they know. Um, so, you know, do that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're doing a project, you are uh, probably not the first one doing at least something similar. I would ask on the LS Tech email list, figure out who is already engaged in the project and what their practical outcomes were. Yep, absolutely. Fantastic. And that um, kind of shout out to the LS NTAP community makes a nice segue to, Brian, are there uh, future webinars that you want to talk about or other things coming up on the LS NTAP side? Uh, definitely. We have put together our webinar schedule for the year. It is up at lsntap.org slash training. It is linked on our front page. Um, we've got a webinar coming up on April 12th on using Google Analytics to understand web traffic. And then we've got one coming up on privacy, encryption, and anonymity, uh, and the use of expert systems and predictive analytics. Um, that second one is a brand new topic for us um, with out of the ATJ Technology Center from Florida. So that's the first time we're gonna be um, really working with them on a project. Um, all of these are going to be recorded and put up on our YouTube channel, but we have over 12, and I think we're maybe up to 16 by the end of the year, free webinars available to the community. Fantastic. And just to put in a plug for that analytics seminar, which is one that we are also conducting over here at Idealware, that is in fact a fairly different webinar than other analytics um, uh, sessions we've conducted in the past. It's a little bit more of a 201 deep dive into not just kind of the basics of analytics, but how to really think about tracking kind of referral paths through your website, thinking about the campaign functionality and how that might help you understand where traffic is coming from, uh, really with a kind of a deep dive into understanding um, where your traffic is coming from and how you might be able to drive more to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you um, so much, John, for all of your insight. I, and <laughs> thank you for helping me to fill the time in a little bit of uh, technical de uh, 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 issues there. So I really appreciate all your, all your wisdom. My, my pleasure. Yes. It's, been, it's been fun. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you so much, John. I, I look forward to having you on uh, for other topics in the future. And thank you once again, Laura. Uh, we're very happy to be hosting um, Idealware again for our webinar series this year. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.